All right, well, as we delve in, I want you to notice I have color-coded these verses for you because colors are fun. And yellow, yellow is going to present to us this Jewish context. So when you see yellow, think of Jesus' intentions, Jesus' audience, which is all Jewish. At that time, he is presenting law-based teaching, the law on steroids, raising the standard, exposing the true spirit of God's law, and the Jews would gasp at it. They would gasp and gulp. They would gasp, there's no way. And then they would gulp and get that little guilty gulp going on inside their throat. And again, that was Jesus' intention to bury all of them under the pride and hypocrisy of law-keeping. So here we go. Notice the transition of topic. Again, I just want to repeat that verses 1 to 16, blessed are those, but now, but now look. He says, do not think that I came to abolish the law, first time this is introduced, the law or the prophets I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So here we see a really important truth for those of us who believe in God's grace, a really important truth to hold on to. Some people say that we are law bashers. Some people claim that we are law haters. No, it's quite the opposite. Watch this now. We are not saying that the law has gone away. We are saying the law has been fulfilled. Big difference. We are not saying the law is dead. We are saying that we as believers have died to the law. The law is not dead. We are dead to the law. Big difference. So let the law be alive. Let the law do its work. Let the law convict the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds so that they see their need for God. But once you are transferred out of Adam and into Christ, you die to the law so that you might live for God. This is not a lawless life. We are then guided by the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Jesus never leads us into sin. This is not a chaotic life, a lawless life. We are led by the law of Christ, that is the power of Christ, the principle of Christ, the person of Christ, the indwelling of Christ. Christ in you is enough for any system of morality and ethics will fall short in comparison to Jesus indwelling us. And so Jesus is revealing the balanced view. So many people say regarding the topic of law and grace, we need balance. And their supposition is that we need a balance between law and grace. And Jesus is saying, no, let law be law to the fullest so that you then see why you need grace to the fullest. Let law be law to the fullest so that grace can be grace to the utmost. And when we allow the stringency of the law to stand up, and point its 613 bony fingers in our direction saying, I accuse you and you're guilty and you fall short of the glory of God, then we throw up our arms and we say, what can I do in response to this? I can do nothing. And Jesus Christ says, exactly. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And I invite you to a new way of grace because the law kills and the Spirit gives life. He goes on, he says, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. So how much of the law should we delete? How much of the law should we push over in the corner? How much of the law should we just sort of talk over and let it sort of just pass away, shove it under the rug. None of it. It all stands. It's all in our face. The law and its glory, limited as it is, is designed to be put up on a pedestal and honored to the utmost. Now, do you see what's happening, though? People are saying, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I mean, you're free from this part of the law, but not this part. Yeah, you're dead to this part, but not this part. Yeah, you're free from the ceremonial law, but, but not the moral law. Yeah, of course you're not under the sacrificial law, but you're still under the Ten Commandments. No, you're not under the Sabbath, but you're still under the Nine Commandments. Uh, do you see what we're doing? We're slicing up God's law to get it the way we like it. And then we all break off into denominations and somebody says, I'll take the Sabbath. And somebody says, I'm not doing the Sabbath. And somebody else says, well, I'll do tithing. And somebody else says, I'm free from tithing, just the rest of the law. And you see, we're chopping it up and dividing ourselves into all kinds of denominations as we cherry pick from God's law and Jesus won't have it. The Son of God has not given us that option. The law is an all-or-nothing proposition. So I want to ask you this morning, who is it that truly respects God's law? Is it the person who is cherry-picking and taking some of it? Or is it the person who says 613 laws in their entirety cursed is everyone who does not obey everything written in the book of the law? Well... If that's true, I'm cursed. I respect all of it, and that's why I turn to God's grace instead. Do you see that when you turn to God's grace instead, you are the one who has respected God's law? Everyone else who is flirting with God's law, cherry-picking from God's law, selecting the parts that they want to make a theology that's comfortable, that is not respecting God's law. God's law is an all or nothing proposition. The book of James says, if you keep the whole law and stumble in one point, you are guilty of all of it. Just a moment ago, I quoted from Galatians and I said, cursed is everyone who does not obey how much? Everything written where? In the Ten Commandments? No. Listen to it. Cursed is everyone who does not obey everything written in the book of the law. Do you know what that is? That is the laws contained in the first five books of the Old Testament. The Torah, the whole thing, 600 plus, not the 10, not tossing the Sabbath and making it the nine, all of it. The law is an all-or-nothing proposition, and that is Jesus' whole point. Not the smallest part of it, not the tiniest bit of it will pass away until everything has been accomplished, until heaven and earth disappear, and we get a new heaven and a new earth. Now, last time I checked, we're still on the old earth. Last time I checked, heaven and earth have not passed away. And so, with that said, the law is alive and well, and convicting the unbeliever. But we are dead to the law. Got a coveting problem? Trust Jesus, not Moses. Got a stealing problem? Trust Jesus, not Moses. Got an adultery problem? Trust Jesus, not Moses. Do you see? He wants our attention. He wants our dependency. He wants to be our everything. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And you know what? You know what his crowd thought at that point? Ooh, ooh, pick me, pick me. I want to be great. And you can imagine them just taking down the list. Okay, well, let's see. Uh, number 423. 420, they've got their list of commandments. Whoever can keep these without missing one is going to be called awesome. I mean, people are going to be looking at you in heaven. Woo! You're going to be a big deal. It's kind of like when the disciples, you know, the disciples are trying to be first. And Jesus says, well, actually, let me tell you a little bit about that. Uh, the last are going to be first and the first are going to be last. And, and they're going, who's on first? What? They're confused. And Jesus explains to them, hey, you know what? You're going to get the Holy Spirit living in you. I will call to remembrance everything I've taught you. This will all make sense later. And then 
You read the teachings of Peter, James, John, and Brother Paul. Not one of them is talking about being called great in heaven. They've got a revelation. They've got a revelation that was given to us through the parable of the vineyard workers. We all get paid the same. Grace doesn't stop at the gates of heaven. There is no rank up in heaven. There is no greatest and least and best and most popular and all that stuff. And so, are we annulling these commandments? No. We're saying they stand. Are we trying to say these are dead? No. We're saying they're alive and they convict the ungodly. Are we thinking that we can obey them and be called great? No, we're not thinking that either. We've come to our senses, haven't we? When he says, be perfect like your heavenly father is perfect, the only way that's going to happen is not by keeping 600 plus things. The only way that's going to happen is for by one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are the holy ones. Do you see? Perfection is a gift Righteousness is free. For I say to you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I would challenge someone 2,000 years ago to take this verse and march it over to the city of Corinth. March it over to a Greek city. You know what questions you're going to get. Uh, Pharisees, uh, who are they? Scribes and Pharisees, what are you even talking about? Are they righteous? What is righteous? This is not for Gentiles. This is for the Jews in Jesus' day to look around them and go, wow, are you telling me that all these efforts and all this rigor and all this fervor and all this adamant attempt at, at behavior improvement and obedience, that everything I see among these Pharisees around me, everything I see among these scholars of the law, that I have to compete and win against that righteousness? which they think is something? Well, the end of the story is that that sort of righteousness is like filthy rags. And there is no righteousness in our works. But right now, he's grabbing their attention. This is not a sweet passage for Christian growth. This is about entering heaven or entering hell through self-effort, competing and winning against the Jews and the most obedient of them. You have heard, where would they have heard? In Moses, in the Old Testament. You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. What court? The Jewish court. Now, let me just remind you why I've highlighted these in yellow. Do you remember? It's because today, fast forward 2,000 years later, and within American Christianity, what you see, the average dissertation on the Sermon on the Mount, is to take the principles, to glorify those principles, and then tell everybody, give it your best shot. And that's what Jesus meant. Give it your best shot. This is for the church, they would say. This is for you. Make your best effort and good luck. Well, I want you to notice everything that's highlighted in yellow this morning. You have heard. Who is the you? You Jews have heard. Where have they heard? In the law, the Old Testament law. Answerable, liable to the court. What court? A Jewish court. You are reading someone else's mail. And that's illegal. <laughs> but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. So that would include Mr. T, because he pities the fool. <laughs> but you see what's happening here. The Old Testament standard is presented. The Old Testament standard is this. Hey, don't commit murder. And you're good. 
I mean, at least that's what they thought. Avoid murder, avoid adultery, and you're on a pretty good road. Now Jesus is saying, anger equals murder. And calling somebody a fool is like a curse word, and you're guilty. What does it say? How guilty? Guilty enough to lose a few rewards in heaven. Is that what it says? Guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. Wow, is this a sweet passage for Christian growth? No. Hell is threatened three times in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is showing that self-effort will never do it. You're not going to get to heaven by being good. Therefore, now it gets interesting, now it gets weird, now we're really going to have to wrestle with it. All of the teachers and authors and leaders who have just sort of smoothed over the Sermon on the Mount and made it about us today, well, we've got some splaining to do, don't we? Here it is. Therefore, if you are presenting your offering at the altar, how many of you have done that recently? Have you presented your offering at the altar? And there, at the altar, there you are holding your bull or your goat or your lamb. There you are, and you realize, I've got something against my brother. So it says, leave your offering before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Now, I know, again, a lot of uh, different teachings have done the following. They've turned this into the Lord's Supper. Now, what do you have to offer at the Lord's Supper? Think about how we celebrate the Lord's Supper all over the world. What do you bring? What is your offering? There is no offering. You bring nothing. We do it in remembrance of His offering. We eat and drink in His name in remembrance of what He did. We don't bring something to the table. We take. We take in remembrance of Him. And so this is misapplied. And the reason perhaps that it's misapplied is because we're looking for some way to reconcile how does this apply to Christians. And I'm just saying, what if, what if it doesn't? What if that's the simple answer? It doesn't because this is before the cross and it's about animal sacrifice and the cross changes everything. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way. I mean, why are you with him? Why don't you walk a separate route? But nevertheless, there you are with your opponent. Hey, buddy, I'll see you in court in five minutes. While you're on your way so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge. What judge? The Jewish council. The judge which presides over the Jewish council the judge to the officer, and you then be thrown into prison. What kind of prison? A Jewish prison. Truly, I say to you, you will not come out of there until you've paid up the last cent. You have heard, again, where have they heard? The Old Testament law. You have heard, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully for, for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. All right, tell me about your heart. Do you have a lustful heart? Even if adultery is committed for a believer, is it coming from the heart? Think about this. Jesus said, we have a new heart. He said, I took out your heart of stone and I gave you a new heart. Then he said, he poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. If you have committed the sin of adultery or looked with lust, which is the same, do you recognize as a new covenant believer that doesn't come from your heart? Have you ever thought a thought that you don't want to think? Have you ever thought a thought that you're uh, ashamed of, that you regret? Oh, not this group, right? Not us. I'm just talking about other church people. No, but... You know, you think thoughts that you don't want to think. What is, the, what is the scripture? What perspective does it give us? It tells us very clearly we're doing the thing that we don't want to do. That means that we're obedient from the heart. He took out our heart of stone and gave us an obedient heart. Your head might be all over the place, but your heart is rock solid. Your head might be a roller coaster of experience. You get one thought at 1 p.m. By 1.30, you're praising the Lord. By 2 o'clock, you're cursing in your mind. 
By 3 o'clock, somebody's cut you off in traffic. It's even worse. By 4 o'clock, you got your Christian radio on and feeling all spiritual. I mean, <laughs> look at you. Your experience in the head is a roller coaster. Your reality in the heart is steady and stable. You've got a new heart. That's why we need to live from the heart, give from the heart, live from the heart, decide from the heart, instead of letting our unrenewed minds take over all the time. And so, what does this mean then? Have we committed adultery in our hearts? Not in our hearts. We might have chosen poorly. We might have committed sins. And we're forgiven if we're believers. But the point I'm making is it didn't come from the heart. So who's he talking to? Who's he talking to here? Again, Jewish people before the cross, familiar with the law. And he's saying, you thought that avoiding inappropriate relations was the standard of Moses, the standard of the law. Let me show you what the real standard is. Even if you look, then you've done it. I had somebody email me a few days ago from far away, and their, their concern was, you're just saying that somebody can go out, and their thing was, you know, commit adultery. I didn't write this, but I felt like writing back, well, you commit adultery every day. What? You don't know me? I don't commit adultery every day. I don't. You don't know me. But isn't that true of all of us in a sense? If this passage presents law to the ultimate standard, if just looking with lust equals adultery, if we're going to go by this standard, then we've all done it. Every day, every week, every month, even if you're conservative, once a month, okay? <laughs> once a month. You're a monthly adulterer <laughs> under the law, okay? Giving you benefit of the doubt there, all right? You're self-controlled 29 days. That's pretty good. But you see what he's done here. It's created the gulp of guilt and condemnation so that there's an obvious need for another way. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out. Man, I was feeling good till verse 29. <laughs> Throw it from you, for it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown where? Into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to, be, to go into hell. So again, we're at a crossroads, aren't we? We've got two choices, really. We've got, oh, he didn't really mean. And are we going to do that to Jesus? Who are you to run around saying, oh, he didn't really mean. That is the most popular uh, interpretation of this, he didn't really mean. Or you could go with, he meant, and that's the true spirit of the law, and thank God we are not under the law. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You know, the Jews were doing all this. They were doing all of this legally. Oh, yeah, uh, don't like you anymore. Here's your certificate. Don't like you anymore. It's been four years. Uh, here's your certificate. Kind of tired of you. Uh, take this uh, certificate and go away. You see, that's what the Jews were doing. And again, watch this, again, he takes the standard and raises it. And everyone who had been abusing women in that regard, treating them poorly, once again, what happens? The gulp of guilt sets in. And that's the whole point. Now, side note, how many times have Christians abused Christians with this passage misapplied? Has someone given you a guilt trip about a divorce? Has someone given you a guilt trip about remarriage? You are well within your right to turn to them and simply ask for one thing, an amputation. <laughs> Just one body part, that's all I'm asking. 
I will heed your warning as you call me an adulterer if you will simply become an amputee. <laughs> same passage. Same passage. And so do you see it? Jesus is saying, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect, tells the rich man to sell everything, and then he raises the standard, the law-based standard on divorce, and they all go away condemned, not one man left standing. Again, you have heard the ancients say, you shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. That comes from Leviticus 27 about vows. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem. Anyone swearing by Jerusalem lately? I swear by Jerusalem. Not real popular in West Texas, is it? I haven't heard it. Jewish context, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black, but let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything else is evil. Anybody ever said, I swear? Anybody said, I swear on the Bible? That's when it gets serious. <laughs> you brought God's word into it. Even stronger, I swear on my grandma's grave. <laughs> I mean, now you're legit, right? He's saying, don't do any of that. Under this standard, all of that is sin and evil. And everybody goes, <gasps> but everybody in this room should then go, <sighs> dead to the law, free from the law, not under the law. Christ is the end of the law for all those who believe. For you have heard it was said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. Whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him also. Somebody said, is this about forgiveness? No, it's not really about forgiveness. It's about letting people take advantage of you without resistance. That's what this is about. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let them sue you. Let them have your shirt. Let them have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with them too. How are people feeling at this point? Do you see? We're going to finish, we're going to conclude, but it's all the same attitude as I finish out these verses. Look at this. Give to him who asks of you. Do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. At this point, I'm asking the deacons to come forward to collect car keys. Um, I, I wouldn't mind having a vehicle a day for the next year, a different vehicle every day. So please leave your car. I'm asking of you. Jesus' words. Yes, I'm being facetious. Yes, I'm being sarcastic. But is Jesus not presenting a ridiculous standard that you would have to give to anyone who asks of you without question, let anyone borrow from you without hesitation? Do you see it? We are nowhere near this. And some say, well, you should try. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. How many of you in your quiet time have got a long list of your enemies and you're just because the Lord's helping you do that? We've made this into some pious thing and we're going to read about two verses to create that piety. We are not allowed to create the standard from one or two verses. That's not the point. The point is that 30 plus verses present us a perfect and impossible standard. So that, why? Why would you do this? So that you could achieve sonship. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good. Sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Again, hell threatened three times. Heaven invited multiple times. This is about heaven and hell and heaven and hell. It is not about sweet Christian daily growth. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same? This is not talking about the IRS. This is talking about the Jewish view of tax collection. 
If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the, ooh, this is interesting, do not even the Gentiles do the same. Do you see what's just happened? In these final verses, he has revealed for sure who the audience is. Do not even those Gentiles over there, not talking to them because you're Jews, but don't even those Gentiles do the minimum. Under the law, you're required to do the maximum. All right, last verse of the passage. Therefore, here's all you got to do. Just let me sum it up. Super simple. Just be perfect. Maybe you don't understand perfect. Maybe you thought the words that are coming out of my mouth were be very good. Well, let me explain even further. Just be perfect just like God is perfect. That kind of perfect. So that there's no misunderstanding. Do you see the law kills? And if the law kills, guess what law 2.0 does? If the law kills, guess what the true spirit of the law does? If the law kills, guess what the law on steroids does? And this is what Jesus presented. So what did we see today? Sure, the first 16 verses of this chapter in Matthew are beautiful. Blessed are those who, blessed are those who. But there was a real transition as Jesus presented a new topic of the law. Is this a sweet passage for Christian growth? No, that is not its purpose. And hell is threatened three times. Is this passage only exaggeration? No, it should be taken literally as the true spirit of God's law. Was this sermon directed at Jews and Gentiles alike? No, notice the undeniable Jewish context repeated throughout. Is the standard presented in the sermon attainable by any of us? No, and that's the whole point. The true spirit of the law highlights our need for God's grace. Does it not? Let's pray together. Father, we honor the law. We lift up the law. We recognize the perfect and impossible standard of the law. We put it on a pedestal. We recognize its perfection, that the law is holy and good. We recognize all of that, and then we admit we can't do it, so we need your grace instead. In this way, we hold up the law, we uphold it, we honor it, but we can't obey it. And so we approach you by grace, we approach you by the blood of Jesus, we approach you by the righteousness given in his resurrection. Father, we thank you that we are made right as a free gift not by our works. We thank you for this picture crystal clear from your son that the law is both perfect and impossible. We agree and we opt for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.